um, it's quite an honor to be here in Egypt uh, this morning, and it's more of an honor to follow Dr. Bokasha, the godfather of Egyptian psychiatry, uh, as a speaker. Um, it was quite interesting and provocative uh, talk by Dr. Akasha, and I'm, I'm humbled that uh, I'm following in his footsteps uh, this morning. I know you have different choices that you could go to this morning. I'm glad you're here, and uh, I'm honored to be here uh, coming to you from, from Canada. I do want to thank the, the sponsors at uh, Lubeck International that have given me this opportunity to speak to you this morning. And I think it's, it's important for me to kind of, if I can introduce myself a little bit more. Um, now, how many of you know where Canada is? Yeah? Okay, good. Good, that's good. Sometimes if you're an American, they don't know where Canada is. But Egyptians, I think, know where Canada is. Now, I, the reason I, I bring this map is that most of you are familiar with different parts of Canada, like if I can, I don't know if this is working here, but I'll go here. Everybody knows Vancouver, British Columbia, yeah? All right, and if you go all the way, everybody knows Toronto, Montreal, yes? But I don't live in those places, okay? I live in this little place in Western Canada called Alberta. You've heard of Alberta? Yeah, Edmonton? Have anybody ever been to Edmonton? Okay, come, okay, good, come and visit me soon, okay? The reason I bring up that map of Canada is my parents came when I was about six years old from India, and I went to school in a very small town just outside of Edmonton, and I remember when I was reading my history classes and my social studies classes, how amazing the history of Egypt was for me. And I fell in love with Egyptian history, the pyramids, the pharaohs, and this is my first visit. And yesterday, I went and saw the pyramids and the Sphinx, and it felt like a dream come true for me. It was as if I was a little child visiting the memories of my childhood through the textbooks, and here I am. And so I'm honored here to be here. And I wanted to tell you that it's very proud that I can be here from, from Canada. But I want to also tell you that you have a very rich history of mental illness in terms of the contribution of Egyptians to mental health. And prior to coming here, I, I, I looked at a little bit of the history. I was not as familiar with Dr. Okasha as you are. But he has written some of the most amazing uh, work on the history of the contribution of Egyptians to mental health. And this is a paper from 20 years ago, if you want to uh, dive into it. I feel humbled even talking about this, because Dr. Okasha can probably go into details about this. But the concept of mental health is not new. It's been described in the Pharaonic era, papyrus back in 1900 BC, referred to gynecological matters and the concepts of hysteria, which, you know, we talk about the displacement of, of the uterus and the wandering uterus that you may remember as uh, you were learning. But the whole idea of psychotherapy in different formations was also discussed in the, in the ancient uh, Egyptian texts, such as uh, incubation and the temple sleep that um, was promoted by I hope I'm saying this word right, Imhotep, who apparently was one of the great first physicians in Egypt. And one of the first establishments of mental health hospitals was actually in the Middle East, around Damascus and Baghdad. And one of the most prestigious hospitals was here in Cairo, called the Kaloon Hospital. And what was unique about this hospital was that it was a general hospital. And so it had its surgery units, its medical units, but it also had mental health units. And so the idea that psychiatry was not different from the rest of medicine in Egypt was way ahead in terms of integrating that. And what they also spoke about in, in the paper was how 
uh, very wealthy people would contribute to the hospital to sort of approach treatment of patients in a biopsychosocial model. Much of what we praise today was practiced in the 1200s. And so there's a rich history that this country has contributed. And sometimes when you're in Western world, you just have a Western-centric uh, view of things. But I want to tell you, there's a great contribution of the Middle East and Egypt for this. And I think eventually this idea of mental illness being magical or sorcery to a brain-based approach really has contributed immensely to it. So that's just a quick overview of the doctor conscious here. I'm sure you can give you a lot more details about that. Now look, I have the, the opportunity of chairing this symposium. We don't have a lot of time, about 45 minutes left. <clears throat> I've given the introduction. I've got about a 20, 25 minute talk on components of depression and perhaps side effects of medications, which I think really impair our patients from having a good life. I'm going to talk a little bit about anhedonia, emotional blunting, and low motivation and depression, what it is and what we can do about it. So there's good news with that. And then we are going to virtually, I hope this is one of the last virtual, but Dr. Piero from Italy wasn't able to attend today, but he's going to be joining us uh, uh, virtually, and he's going to be talking about the dose relationship of antidepressant treatments, efficacy and tolerability consideration. Okay, so you ready for this? Okay, very good. We need your enthusiasm. Um, we've already uh, been introduced to, to myself. Um, and I want to tell you that I've been working in this area for about 30 years. And I've been really blessed to work with many organizations and companies. And they made me a better doctor, a researcher. But what I'd like to also convey to you this morning is my clinical experience. I think that's the first thing I do is I see lots of patients. And I'm hoping to integrate the science, the research, to my clinical practice so that we can have a real life discussion on how to help our patients. Okay? So there is a title for my talk this morning Anatomia, Emotional Blunting, and Low Motivation and Depression What are the Implications for Functional Recovery? So these are the main objectives that I want to be able to address today. What they are, what they look like, what causes it, and more importantly, what we can do. More specifically, we are going to look at Moriarty's role in addressing these factors of functional impairment. So that when you go back this afternoon or tomorrow, you're going to look at your patient in a different way, I promise you, after this session. Okay? But I'm going to ask you a question. Is it okay? I'm going to ask you a question which I think. I thought this was easy when I graduated 32 years ago. What is depression? And I remember being a young doctor thinking, ah, DSM, I'll memorize a few symptoms, and there is depression. Well, boy, was I wrong. And the more I have gotten into this whole area, I realize that this is a question that still is a work in progress. I will tell you this is that ultimately depression as I now see it and the way neuroscience is is that it's a disease of lost connections and when you start with the basis of the brain that there is a circuitry there is a neurotransmitter there is a genetic component that puts some of us at higher risk than others to be at risk for this condition but if you've done any meaningful clinical work, you know that depression isn't just a brain disease, although it has a disease. I want you to think of depression as a syndrome, as a complex condition that has many causations. We know the contributions of childhood trauma. We know also, especially in this day and age, the effect of stress of being disconnected from each other as a community. I gotta tell you, we were talking about this earlier, of uh, where the digital world has connected us, but in so many ways it's made us more disconnected than ever before. We're more lonely, we're more isolated, and that affects how the brain perceives these uh, conditions. Disconnection from people, disconnection from work, disconnection from purpose. 
And I think one of the biggest things that we can do with psychiatry, more so than any other field, is that I think we can use a brain-based neuroscience to really understand the brain, the mind, and the body to restore the person to their fullest function, to their well-being. And I think psychiatrists are really good at this. We have to look at it in a way that, I think Dr. Okasha touched on this, is a broad-based approach. We need to dive into it. Now, in Canada, these are the guidelines, and part of those guidelines, we all agree now that we have to move beyond just symptoms to a level of functional recovery. We all agree that symptoms alone won't help our patients go back to work, to connect with our families, to connect with our children, to connect with our spirituality. We need more than that. And we need to look at functional recovery right from the very beginning of when the patient comes into our office. Because ultimately, what we're looking for are not symptoms, but meaningful connections, as I said. Connections within our families, our children, our work, our community, our world. And this is what depression can do. It can really impair those disconnections. So I don't think I'm telling you anything new about functional recovery. However, when I first started about 30 years ago, most of it was just get them a little bit better. Let's drop their HAMD scores and their monitor scores, and now functioning is the goal because we're human and we want to be able to recover what we've lost, or for some of us, even gain more what we haven't. When I first started, the question was all about feelings, emotions, but we began to understand that this is a disease of the brain that affects circuits and the body. And we now understand depression as syndrome, and it's really important for us to identify the symptoms that our patients are the most impaired by and have targeted, personalized approaches for this. And so I want to focus on today factors which I think have been minimized in addressing full functional recovery, and that's emotional blunting, anhedonia, and lack of motivation. We're going to dive into them because there's correlates with all three of them. Now, with all of these three major symptoms, there's similarities and overlap and differences. Okay? Now, the first one is emotional blunting. In my clinical experience, most of the emotional blunting that I see is often medication induced. All medications can do this, some more than others, the SSRI specifically. What is emotional blunting? We're going to get to that in a second. Anhedonia, as you know, is one of the core features of depression. It looks like emotional blunting, kind of acts like emotional blunting, but it's different. But we need to look at it that as well. And tied into both anhedonia and emotional blunting is the sense of apathy or low motivation. And they both seem to be associated with anhedonia and emotional blunting. Now, in terms of what emotional blunting is, I did not recognize this, folks, until much later in my career. I actually thought these were depressed patients, but I realized there was something more. So emotional blunting, patients will tell you, they'll say, I don't feel anything. I feel numb. I feel detached. I feel flat. I feel disconnected. I feel apathetic. Are you depressed? No, 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 I, I don't feel depressed. That medication you're doing, I don't feel depressed. But you know what? I, I had my baby daughter was born three weeks ago. I should be very happy, but I, I don't feel that joy. Have you had this? Yeah? Another one said, I went to a funeral the other day. It's a very good friend of mine. We were childhood, you know, close friends, and he died tragically. I went to the funeral, and I couldn't feel, I couldn't cry. That must be horrible. Can you imagine not having those emotional reactions to things that are both positive and negative? I will tell you, patients don't want to be this way. We want to feel something. And oftentimes, this is associated with patients not following through with medication. Now, anhedonia, I'm sorry, emotional blunting, is very much, we think, associated with dopaminergic systems. 
in the brain. I mean, dopamine is that feel-good hormone, right, you're a transmitter. And we know that certain antidepressants especially, while increasing serotonin neurotransmission, can dampen downregulation of norepinephrine and dopamine pathways. So these are the kind of things to keep in mind. I think it's important that you may want to screen at baseline uh, questions like this in terms of your emotional reactivity to both positive and negative symptoms. That is what emotional wanting is. Most of the time, I don't usually see it at baseline, although it can. The thing with emotional blunting is that it also leads to being very apathetic and lacking drive and motivation and, of course, functional impairment. Now, when you look at anhedonia, this, of course, is one of the core features of depression, all right? And it's this reduced inability to feel pleasure. And it's usually something to do with positive things or anticipating something desirable. And anhedonia seems to be impacting that particular component of depression. And again, it involves various dopaminergic, central mesocortical, and mesolimbic pathways. And this, again, I think is an important component of depression for you to identify at, at a baseline. It's different than emotional blunting because it usually is towards the positive things. So for example, you know, um, I love playing golf. And my patients would say, normally I would love to go golfing, but yeah, I don't enjoy it anymore. I'm not having pleasure. Just the clubs are in the bag. I'm not doing much. That's anhedonia. So similar to emotional blunting, but different, right? And that is why it's important for you to know the difference between it. And ideally, you want to be able to ask the questions at the very beginning. Emotional blunting is for both positive and negative uh, situations. Anhedonia is usually a, a, for more positive things. Now, why is this important? And I've learned this the hard way. So this young man who had a, a, new, a baby girl um, started to not take his medications. So as soon as he stopped taking it, he started to feel joy. He's enjoying his baby, but then he also became irritable and a little bit angry. And his wife began to notice this problem. So once in a while, they'll go back on his antidepressant. He would feel less anxious, less irritable, but he had no joy. Eventually, the wife said, what's wrong with you? Let's go talk to Dr. Chaka. He'll figure you out. The, you know, the psychiatrist will figure him out. The problem was he was not following through with the medications because of the emotional blunting. So compliance with medications is a big problem with people with emotional blunting. Because you want to be able to stay on something in order to feel it and its effect. Now, anhedonia and emotional blunting are very much intertwined, but with emotional blunting, iatrogenic causes are probably at the root of this. Now, all antidepressants are likely to cause it, but from our clinical experience as well as clinical data, the SSRIs are more likely to cause it. Okay? But I know the number one antidepressants for all of us are SSRIs, right? We love the SSRIs because they're good for mood and anxiety. But are you keeping track of this symptom? Have you asked patients about this? Do they tell you about this? Because they don't quite know. They, they sometimes think it's depression. But we know that this leads to functional impairment, non-compliance with medications. And when you can't feel something for both good and bad, you're thinking, this is not life. I want to live like this. I want to feel something. So these are the data that's, that's been shown. Now, the other thing is with anhedonia, it's one of the most debilitating symptoms when it comes to psychosocial functioning and, and functional recovery, more so than even symptom reduction of, of, on the virus. So you can have certain symptoms get better, but if your inability to enjoy pleasure, to feel pleasure is not there, this will lead to a poor outcome. And one of the things I think, and this is a study between how patients view their symptoms 
and how doctors view their symptoms. And what you can see is that in the, in the darker patient cohort, when you looked at emotional blunting and anhedonia, numerically, emotional blunting had an impact on work, family life, social life, and quality of life, much less viewed by family physicians and specialists. So I believe now, as I've gotten older, and I've learned, patients' views come first. That was different than when I went to med school 30 years ago. Doctors knew everything, and we could tell the patients, no, no, we're living in a completely sophisticated world. And patients are driving a lot of the, the kind of approaches that I... So remember this, this is impactful. And patients are not going to take treatments that are not going to be helpful. Now, let's move into some details of how we can, can, can deal with this. There's a story about how emotional blunting is very common. Over two-thirds of patients with SSRIs experience this, and that can lead to discontinuation. So, what do we do about it? All right, so here's what my practical stuff is. When you have a patient in front of you, I really would like to get baseline symptoms, and what the symptoms are that are the most impairing for them. Inquire about emotional blunting. Now there's a, there's a questionnaire that I'm going to show you, but it's a lot of work for that. But I think you can basically ask one question, you know, what are your reactions to the most to the positive things in your life and to the negative things? Emotional blunting people will say, you know what, I, I don't feel anything. I don't feel anything for the bad, I don't feel anything for the good. The anecdotal people will say, you know what, I just don't enjoy pleasure. And I'm crying all the time when things are not good. So get it at baseline. The second part is knowing how to choose a medication. I'm going to go with medication first, assuming that it's moderate to severe major depressive disorder. I know Dr. Okasha said try psychotherapy first. I think that's going to be a case by case experience. In my experience, when I dealt with patients who come to my clinic with moderate to severe major depression, it is very challenging, I find, to start psychotherapy initially because of the cognitive challenges that they have in terms of memory, executive function. I do believe that properly chosen medications, appropriately chosen medications, can make a huge difference in outcomes. So one of the things we want to do is choose medications that are not going to make things worse. First, do no harm. And one of the things that we're now beginning to understand is that not all antidepressants are created equal. So I want you to forget this myth that I was taught that it didn't matter which medication you pick, they're all the same. Is that what you hear? Yeah? Stop thinking like that. Now, is one better than the other? No. So when you put them all together in that analysis, there are some differences. The efficacy is superior to placebo, but some are different than the others, and that's where you're going to have to understand which ones to choose. This morning, I'm going to introduce you to Vortiox team. Now, I know you're familiar with this product, but I want to tell you that there's some advantages to Vortiox team where I think they should be considered as first line for almost all of your patients for many reasons. But number one, in this particular topic of anhedonia and emotional blunting, there's some provocative neurobiology which I think almost compels us to use agents like oreoxetine and others like SNRIs and the NDRI like bupropion as your first line. So this is an agent that works on multimodal, both serotonin reactive inhibition and its downstream effect on receptor modulation with various serotonin medications. The beauty of this medication is that it is not an SSRI, but it's a multimodal agent. When you look at it to my extreme left, with its antagonism in 5-HT3 and 5-HT7, you actually are getting uh, more than just serotonin release. You're getting acetylcholine, histaminergic, dopaminergic, norepinephrine, as well as glutamatergic. And this was a very provocative molecule that led to some studies that I'm going to present to you as to why this may be an agent to tackle anhedonia, tackle emotional blunting, and improve low motivation and apathy that you can get. So one of the, the uh, interesting work is that the CERT receptor, 
the, um, the transporter receptor that uh, is often involved in, in medications, when you actually look at Bordeauxity, it has to be lower occupancy, which is good in a way, because you don't want it too much, because that's where you know higher neurotransmission of serotonin can cause dampening downstream. So that was one of the the kind of the early work that said that Bordeauxetine is low serum occupancy as well as its positive effect on dopamine, which we talked about, may have a positive effect on emotional wanting. Furthermore, you're probably very well aware of the pro-cognitive effects of Bordeauxetine. So with this in mind, there was a, a, a research that occurred just recently, which I, I want to share with you, by one of my colleagues in uh, Italy, uh, Facciloni. And to the best of my knowledge, it's the first in the world. And so what they did was they took patients who were partial responders to various antidepressants. The majority in this particular study were on SSRIs, about 80%, a smaller amount on SSRIs. And if they were not responding, they were switched to Bordeauxetine. But they also measured emotional blunting with an instrument called the OEQ. And what they did was, they started everybody on 10 milligrams of bordeauxetine, and you can go up to, to 20 milligrams. Um, the mean dose in this study was about 15 uh, milligrams. And so the outcomes that they were looking at were the emotional blunting, as well as uh, the response on the moderate scores, as well as functioning on the Sheehan Disability Scale, and they look at some cognitive assessments also. But I want to focus on the emotional blunting, because this is what was really quite interesting. What they found was patients who were switched from their previous antidepressants, the majority of them were SSRIs, a few to SSRIs, they began to notice the return of emotionality within the first week, and by the end of eight week, 50% of patients actually experience emotional wanting, uh, in, in emotional enhancement, and detachment of emotions, um, or increase of emotions. So for example, the kind of things they were looking at was that they had more positive emotions. They were more attached to things. They actually cared about things. And they didn't say anymore that this was the antidepressant cause anymore. They actually felt better. So this is the first study that I know of where we can reverse emotional blunting in individuals who are being caused. Ideally, you don't want to cause it, so why not start with something that is less likely to cause it? So bordeauxetine is one of your options. Uh, in my clinical practice, other options include, like I said, the SNRIs like venlafaxine or bupropion. Uh, but again, I think you have to go case by case we have some good evidence with that. So these are the kind of effects that they notice um, in caring, uh, improvement in positivity, emotional attachment, and so on. And if you look at the total score from week one to week eight, it's a very dramatic improvement in terms of emotionality. Now, the other component of depression that we talked about that can be very limiting for patient compliance and functional impairment is anhedonia, this lack of pleasure, lack of enjoyment. And these are my colleagues from Toronto that looked at a thousand patients and looking uh, at, uh, retrospectively, bordeauxetine. And they had a scale called the SNAITH scale, S-N-A-I-T-H, which basically looked at um, anhedonia and another component of anhedonia on the virus. And you can see that bordeauxetine, again, was very effective from a very, about the first couple of weeks down to eight weeks is statistically a matter in decreasing uh, both the obviously the moderate scores, but improving anhedonia. And I think part of the cause and effect is its effect on dopaminergic systems and norepinephrine systems, the ability to feel, the ability to enjoy pleasure. So we have some really good data with anhedonia also with bordeauxetine. And what was nice about the Fagellino study is not only did they look at emotional blunting, but they looked at um, Bordeauxetine's role in motivation, in energy, and socialization. And I think, I, I said to you before, this is a very important coexisting problem with both emotional blunting and anhedonia, is the apathy and the motivation. 
And so we have some very provocative data that's just been published in the last couple of years that the sinister triad of emotional blunting and anhedonia and low motivation may specifically respond to the multimodal agent vortioxetine. And um, I'm trying to get to my last slide, if I can. What last else? slide, please. Last slide. Time is over. Okay, this is interesting. I was very close to finishing up. At the end of the day, in order to achieve functional recovery, you need to treat all of the domains of depression, the cognitive, the emotional, the physical. I hope this morning we've shown you some evidence that vortioxetine has wonderful positive effects on emotional blunting, anhedonia, and motivation, and that you could consider trying it as your first line, especially when your patient has those symptoms. Thank you very much.